So I'll be your host for this presentation, uh, but we do have Tyler Stamey, Phil Greenwald, and Jim Angstadt on the line who uh, might be able to answer questions that uh, I won't be able to answer. So tonight's presentation will first showcase projects planned for construction uh, in 2021 or under construction, followed by those that are planned for design. Uh, the end of the presentation will include a summary of all projects that uh, uh, that we currently have ongoing in 2021, and then we'll have an opportunity to, opportunity to address any questions you may have at the end. So, with that, we'll go ahead and jump into the presentation. So, this first project is perhaps one of the most critical annual projects in our program, and. While it's not necessarily the most glamorous, the our annual pavement management program ensures that previous investments in roadway infrastructure are maximized as much as possible. Uh, the intent being you need to maintain what you have. So this project includes asphalt overlays, concrete repairs, preventative maintenance in the form of chip seal and crack seal. All of this fall on all of those items fall under this asset management project. Uh, I did want to note uh, that the photos you see here are not current year projects. This is just an example of what this project generally represents being a new asphalt overlay. Uh, this project will start in May of this year and uh, is intended to last until September and will cover approximately 319,000 square yards of roadway resurfacing in addition to crack seal as well. One of our next projects under construction is the County Line Road Improvements, which is from 9th Avenue to 17th Avenue, so on the east side of town. Uh, this project falls under the umbrella of our Transportation System Management, or TSM, capital project. The primary improvements will expand access to multimodal transportation and also improve user safety. Uh, the roadway, wa roadway widening will accommodate bike lanes as well as a two-way left turn lane that will serve existing cross streets and private driveways up and down the corridor. Uh, sidewalk is also going to be installed on the west side of the roadway, and there will also be pedestrian refuge islands that will be installed at 17th Ave at the intersection of 17th Avenue. Uh, this project does include a similar asset management component as our pavement management program in that the existing condition of County Line Road is in fairly poor condition, so this is also addressing that at the same time. So this project is also uh, in, on track to be completed in June of this year. So it's fair, come along fairly well at this point. In that same vicinity of County Line Road, we have the recently completed Spring Gulch Number no. Two Phase Two project. Uh, again, on the east side of the city there, and, and alongside channel improvements that were in complete, uh, completed with this project, uh, it also provided much needed trail connection from Stephen Day Park down to Union Reservoir. And one key feature with this project uh, was the addition of the pedestrian refuge island, as you can see in the photo there, crosses underneath County Line Road. So a great addition to the trail connections through the city. This project was completed earlier this year. And also planned for construction later this year, uh, and also following under the TSM umbrella, is the 19th Avenue Multimodal Improvements Project. Uh, this project is actually a continuation. Sorry, of sorry to interrupt. Ninth, Ninth Avenue. Oh, sorry. Getting ahead of myself there. Ninth Avenue uh, Multimodal Improvements Project. So this was a continuation of a project in 2020 that added on-street bike lanes from Ninth. Um, Airport Road to Hover Street. And so for this year with this project, those bike lanes will continue heading to the east uh, and will be added to 9th Avenue between Hover and Kaufman Street. So in order to accomplish this, uh, the existing roadway sections that are have wide travel and parking lanes, as you can see in the photo there, uh, those will be converted to uh, uh, these will be converted to not only provide bike lanes, but also a two-way center left turn lane as shown in the example photo here that just showed up. So these improvements do require that on-street parking will be eliminated in some areas on 9th Avenue, and we do have a public meeting scheduled for the 20th later this month. Uh, these striping changes will occur alongside a preventative maintenance chip seal project that is scheduled to occur a little bit later this year.
So for our next construction project, we have the First Avenue and Emory Street project uh, or intersection improvements. And uh, this project provides improvements to a challenging intersection at the city. And these challenges primarily stem from a unique situation or a unique scenario where there are three separate railroad tracks that cross Emory Street just north of First Avenue. From the photo there, you're actually looking north up Emory Street and can see three sets of tracks there. Uh, so these proposed improvements will include the installation of a traffic signal at this intersection, pedestrian improvements in the form of sidewalks, uh, track crossing upgrades from the current uh, really fairly dilapidated crossing that was there previously. And it's also going to include, uh, include uh, upgrades uh, for uh, to eventually make this a railroad quiet zone. Uh, I did want to note, though, and uh, point out that this crossing will not be able to function as a fully operational quiet zone until adjacent crossings, uh, particularly Main Street, Third Avenue, Terry Street, also have quiet zone features installed. So this project actually just started, uh, I believe it was last week, and is expected to finish in September of this year, so just getting started on this one. So we'll move on from projects under construction to those under design in 2021. The Ken Pratt Boulevard and South Sunset Street intersection improvements project is our third and final project that falls under the TSM umbrella that we have for 2021, at least one of the major ones. Uh, in its current form, Sunset Street crosses Ken Pratt Boulevard uh, at a skew angle with just two through lanes in each direction. Uh, there are no, dedica no dedicated left turns, which can frequently result in long queues, uh, vehicle queues waiting for a safe opportunity to cross traffic on uh, to get onto Ken Pratt Boulevard. And there are also no bike lanes along the segment of Sunset Street from Kansas Avenue to Nelson Road. So this project aims to remedy all of those issues and through minor widening uh, of the roadway and reconfiguration at the intersection, there will be dedicated right and left turn lanes that will be added to Sunset Street that will be installed alongside bike lanes as well. Uh, pedestrian connections crossing the tracks uh, will be reconfigured uh, at that skewed crossing so that uh, uh, pedestrian users and bikes that are using that sidewalk can you, uh, cross the tracks at more of a perpendicular angle uh, than the current skew angle that exists right now. So, these improvements will also include features necessary to eventually make this crossing a railroad quiet zone. Uh, as far as funding is concerned, the city received a $1.2 million grant for this project. We did want to point that out. Uh, that comes alongside a local match requirement of $300,000 for the project. So its project is currently under design and we're looking to have an anticipated construction start of the springtime of 2023. Our next project to take a look at is the second phase of the Boston Avenue Connection project. Uh, for those who weren't aware, the first phase of this project completed a new connection of Boston Avenue from South Main Street to South Martin Street in 2016. Uh, that's actually east of the map that you see here, so off to the right. Um, and the second phase addresses an important east-west gap in con connectivity uh, on Boston Avenue between Boston and Price Road. And with this project that you see right there that just filled in, that would be the gap that would be filled, which would create an unbroken connection of Boston Avenue from Hover to South Martin Street. Um, does technically extend all the way to Airport Road, but at that point it's Rogers Road. So it essentially would have an unbroken connection from Airport Road all the way to Martin Street. So once completed, this project would support uh, the planned route for bus rapid transit that Phil has mentioned in the past as it enters Longmont from the diagonal highway. Uh, bus rapid transit would come in Hover Street uh, from, one night, uh, from the diagonal highway and then head east on Boston Avenue and then use this connection to eventually make its way to uh, Kaufman Street, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. So design is currently underway with this project as well, with construction also planned in 2023. 
So as a quick review of our next project here, uh, for those that aren't aware, the city's enhanced multi-use quarter plan or EMUC, as you may have heard it referred to as, identifies specific roadway corridors with the goal is to bring a trail-like experience to the right-of-way. Uh, one such quarter that was in, identified in that plan was 21st Avenue. And for that particular corridor, the EMUC plan offered a conceptual uh, idea, an improvement that would include uh, buffered bike lanes for this segment. So these bike lanes would be designed from, uh, to be added to the roadway from Main Street to at least the Garden Acres Greenway uh, at Daly Drive. There would be no widening that would be planned with this project, which means that one vehicle lane uh, in each direction of 21st Avenue would need to be eliminated to accommodate the bike lanes. Currently, there are two lanes in each direction on this segment of 21st Avenue. Traffic volumes on the segment of 21st Avenue are currently and projected to remain low enough to support elimination of travel lanes. And then with respect to sidewalks, there are currently not any improvements planned for sidewalks, at least with this current design effort for this project. However, there is an existing eight foot sidewalk on the south side of 21st Avenue now, uh, which is in the nature of the EMEC plan at that location. Uh, this project will start design later this year and is expected to be completed alongside an asphalt rehabilitation project in 2022. The last project that we'll take a look at under design is the Kaufman Street Busway Project. Uh, this is a large project that will add a number of multimodal improvements to Kaufman Street from 1st Avenue to 9th Avenue through the downtown area. Uh, these improvements include the addition of separated bike lanes, wider sidewalks, uh, either center running or side running transit lanes to support bus rapid transit, and all while maintaining the general traffic through the corridor and character of the corridor uh, in that area. Um, the added transit lanes would eventually support the bus rapid transit project uh, in the vicinity of, of Longmont, which will then eventually tie into the future development, uh, development of the first and main station at the corner of First Avenue and Kaufman Street. Uh, the Kaufman Street Busway project is in the early stages of design, and we're currently developing uh, various concept options to take a look at and evaluate. Public outreach is just beginning, which will help inform some of the specific design elements about the project as well. Uh, with this project, with this project being part of the larger BRT Bus Rapid Transit Plan, funding for this project is largely coming from federal and state sources. Uh, with only a $150,000 local match of the total design and construction estimate of $6.9 million. Uh, design is expected to continue through the rest of 2021 and as well as 2022 with construction happening in 2023. So there are other active design and construction projects beyond what uh, I reviewed explicitly this evening. Specifically, those include the State Highway 66 improvements, railroad quiet zones, missing sidewalks, Boston Avenue bridge replacement, and St. Brain Channel improvements. Uh, we can certainly get into those a little bit more detail if there are questions. We do have staff on hand to be able to answer questions about those projects or any of the projects listed here. So with that, I uh, appreciate your time and feel free to ask any questions you may have at this point. Great, thanks so much, Alden, appreciate that. Do we have any questions? I do. Okay. Sorry, it's just a little tricky to... Uh, um, uh, Alden, if it's okay with you, can we uh, uh, go back to yeah. uh, the full screen instead of screen sharing? And that way uh, we can make sure we can see uh, all the different folks there. Oh, wonderful. Hi, Liz, why don't you go first? Thanks. I was just wondering about the meeting for the 9th Avenue <laughs> work. Um, do we have, I assume it'll be online. Is there a link and where will that be published? Uh, it will be online uh, as far as where it's going to be published as far as advertising attendance for the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what we've done is we've sent direct invitations to uh, those residents that are uh, along the frontage in the area of 9th Avenue that would be impacted by, by the parking with the project. 
Uh, we're also going to be posting it uh, on local media outlets and the city website as far as uh, inviting general public to be able to attend the meeting as well. Thank you. And we can provide a link to the board if you're interested in attending as well. Thanks, Tyler. That sounds great. Yes, David. Um, and we might have covered this last time and I've forgotten, but the uh, the uh, railroad bridge uh, replacement, is that is that entirely complete or are, are we nearing completion with that project? Jim, are you able to chime in on that one real quick? Yeah, that would be the um, RSVP um, uh, City Reach 2B. Um, the railroad has been replaced. I uh, believe they've established reestablished the trail under the bridge, um, as well as the ped bridge that is just to the west of the um, the railroad bridge. Uh, as the project continues to move upstream, we've started the second phase or the next phase up Isaac Walton. So really, uh, we have a detour for the trail right at the ped bridge. That goes up a uh, price and then um, I think down Boston. Um, but the so that section of the trail should be or will be open shortly. Um, but uh, again, the next section up my left hand brewery is closed now and will remain closed for several years. Um, one of the other projects that we have coming up, um, you can see a lot of activity. Uh, on the north side of Boston, uh, we're working on the what's called the Isaac Walton Utilities uh, relocation of, of water currently right now, and then later this year we'll be going out to bid to replace the uh, the Boston Avenue Bridge. So there's going to be a lot of activity over the next two years in that area. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, Gordon. What is the time frame for the Kaufman Street uh, project? I know we discussed that earlier, but I didn't see or hear when that's supposed to start. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so design is going to be, uh, we're in the early stages, so it's going to be ongoing for the rest of 2021 and a large part of 2022. Uh, an ideal scenario, we'd like to go to bid in 2022, late in the season for a construction start in the spring of 2023. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? So real quick, just to add to that. Um, well, we will be working um, on Kaufman Street and that um, basically reconstruction of it in 2023. Um, we will be, the city will be undertaking some other projects on in the Kaufman corridor ahead of the, uh, the busway project, uh, we're going to be working on the sanitary sewer uh, in that area. Uh, we'll be doing some lining of that, so it won't be, it'll be less invasive than an open cut. Uh, probably doing some small scale water uh, line replacements uh, so that we are ahead of the, the full blown construction. So over the next couple of years, you'll see a lot of activity in that corridor. Yep. Thanks. Um, one quick question for me, and then we'll go to David. Um, uh, Alden, I was, I was wondering for the uh, one of the, the the projects you mentioned was the intersection between uh, Kim Pratt Boulevard and uh, Sunset. Um, when that project moves forward, do you know is there going to be some sort of overlay on Sunset that will kind of smooth things on? I know when the utility lines uh, were, were were dug for some of the areas a little farther to the north. Um, there were some patch jobs there in the bike lane there, which is certainly uh, rideable there, but uh, is there a sort of a longer vision to be able to kind of smooth it out there with, with a fresh layer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the the improvement project itself at the intersection is actually going to extend to include an overlay uh, from Ken Pratt all the way up to Nelson Road. Uh, so that segment will receive a full overlay alongside this project. Uh, this year in 2021, actually, we'll be doing limited asphalt patching on that same segment. So for their for the areas that are really falling apart that may not quite make it until the time that the overlay can come through, we're going to have to address those in the meantime. So that we'll do some large scale 
uh, larger patches this year with the eventual overlay happening with the construction of the project at the inter intersection. Beyond that, further to the north, Nelson Road to Boston Avenue, that segment of Sunset is not quite ready for an overlay. Uh, so right now that is not included in the project, but I specifically manage the pavement management program throughout the city. And I do have that segment on my radar to potentially add relatively soon to our five year program, since there are segments of it that are starting to, to deteriorate more quickly. Thanks, David. Uh, regarding the Kaufman uh, project, what what are the plans for RTD in during that time period? Will it just stay off of Kaufman? And in particular, what will happen near Roosevelt Park where there's the, the park and ride? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, Phil. Sorry. <laughs> um, we're, we're really going to try to phase that project block by block. So Alden can speak more to that, but I think as we get closer to the um, the actual eighth and Kaufman, or the eight, or that seven hundred block, where the station is currently, we'll need to figure out how we phase that back with first and main, or first and Kaufman. It's it's really going to face onto first and main, so it'll still have that front facing main street facing aspect of the of the station, but most of the action for the buses will happen in the back there with uh, on Kaufman. So. Uh, what we hope to do is, is have s some ability to start staging that piece um, early on and be able to handle buses. If not, if they want to, if we want to go the other direction and start from the north and go south, uh, we'll just need to. We've done this in the past where we've moved those buses and the and the bus operations over to Main Street and just had them be on Main Street and have people walk over from the transit piece there. We'll just need to figure out how to be able to safely cross the street, we might have to do some temporary control for that, but it's a great question. Thank you. All right, any last questions before we uh, jump to the next information item? All right, well, thank you all, and I appreciate it. Well done. Thank you. All right, Phil, why don't we bring you back for a uh, discussion around uh, state transportation funding proposal uh, and Tyler too. And here I will attempt to share again. So see how this goes. I need Alden on my side here. He's the, he's the master of this stuff. I'm going to make this full screen here. So we don't typically bring this, this kind of information to, to, to this board. And I just wanted to say that this is, we, we usually let the legislative stuff we, we make recommendations as staff, and then the staff recommendations all kind of get aggregated into one message to, or one piece to city council. And they typically take it and then they move on with it as far as what recommendation they want to have uh, as compared to what the staff recommendation was. So um, those things are going to happen tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, the city council will talk about this specific thing, but we wanted to bring this to your attention and <clears throat> I hope I don't uh, rue the day that I've decided to do this, but uh, um, wanted to bring this to your attention just to say that there's a lot going on with transportation right now and transportation is very popular at the federal and state level. And so at the state level, and we know, we know a bit about this just from the bill that's been introduced, is that there's a new proposal out there in the state legislature to uh, try to provide a new funding source for transportation. We haven't had really a good funding source for transportation in the 30 years that I've been working in the transportation field since 1991. I think that was the last time, or 92 was the last time they increased the gas tax. So it's been a while before we've had any kind of revenue source for this. And so that's why this is kind of a generational piece. And we wanted to bring it to the attention of the Transportation Advisory Board for what want, just to give you some indication of what's going on, maybe answer some of your questions. If you want to act independently and take this on, or if you want to uh, just have that information in your back pocket when you're uh, talking to neighbors or whatever, um, that's kind of why we provided this to you. So I, I, I preface it with that, and I'll try to go quickly because this is an incredibly, incredibly detailed and and um, involved topic, as, as Council Member Peck can tell you. As she's done a lot of research and been in a lot of these presentations, but I just wanted to go over it 
relatively quickly with you and just try to answer some questions if you have them, but I'm, it's gonna be really difficult for me to answer questions because it is a convoluted, pretty convoluted bill, but it is, I think what we're saying is there's a bigger picture here and it's about funding transportation statewide for the first time in about 30 years where we actually mm -hmm. have real dollars or there's a potential for real dollars to spend. But I don't wanna advocate the bill. I just wanna kind of present it to you and, and uh, let you know, but that's kind of the bigger picture piece of this is this is this is once in a generation kind of thing. We've obviously tried to go to the voters or they've tried to go to the voters, the state has, with different tax proposals and different proposals to raise revenue. And it's all it's all failed. Um, maybe because there were more than one things on one one issue on the ballot and it kind of convoluted the ballot and confused people. And I think that was part of the kind of part of the strategy, quite frankly. But um, this one is at the legislative level. So they're talking about fees instead of taxes. And so they're trying to get around the idea of taxation and the Tabor bill or the Tabor law uh, with this specific uh, language in the legislative. And, and we don't even know at this point, you know, how much of this is legal and how much of it is not. So again, I just want to go through this quickly. I was going to just skip through this first slide, but then I started really reading it. And there's some pretty good information here. And it just talks about um, and this is obviously from the people who kind of put the bill together. So I just want to preface that, that we don't have too much information from the opposing side, except that these, what I did say about fees being used instead of taxes and people not being able to vote on this specifically. So that's that's kind of the big con to this piece whole, I don't want to say con, but pros and cons. This is the, uh, this is the other side of the issue is that, um, you know, this this is being seen as, a way to get around taxes and having people vote on taxation. So that would be the biggest issue, I think, that's that's going against this bill. But, you know, the number one, save Colorado's money and time spent on the roads. Uh, obviously, we spent a lot of time kind of in traffic, and this is going to try to try to work on getting us, uh, getting some congestion relief, besides just adding lanes to highways. But th there is that aspect, especially in the rural areas, of adding um, you know, having the better concrete or the better pavement type, as Alden mentioned for Longmont, we already do that a lot because we have a specific sales tax for roads in Longmont and for transportation in Longmont. And so we're able to go out and fix our local roads, but the state's not able to do that at the statewide level. So you'll see a lot of roads when you're driving around the state, obviously they're in pretty bad condition. Uh, also create a transportation system that supports the dynamic economy while improving air quality. So a lot of this is really meant to uh, really invest in the electric vehicle market uh, and trying to push electric vehicles as being a possible solution to the uh, to greenhouse gas uh, emissions that are happening now and the, the state's goal to, to get those down in the next uh, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. And then also trying to get improve air quality in the in what's called our non-attainment area, which includes much of the front range, the northern front range, I should say. And uh, we, we really are in non-attainment at this point for ozone. And so there's a lot of things that are going to happen in the next couple of years. And we, we probably should get a presentation to you on that as well. But there's a lot of things happening in the next couple of years that are going to be voluntary at first, but then they're going to be mandatory if we're not, if we can't get our ozone levels down below those federal standards. So, uh, and there's probably people on this, on the, in this meeting that know a lot more about that than I do. But um, just to give you a heads up, there's some things coming our way that we need to start working to mitigate some of that ozone production and, uh, and those uh, those different things, because we are we are not meeting the standards because the standards have been ratcheting down. So that's a piece of this as well. And then establish a sustainable funding source, which we just really haven't had in the last 30 years again, because the gas taxes that were implemented were straight um, you know, 22 cents per gallon kind of things. They weren't meant to index with inflation or anything like that. There was no percentage as gas prices increased. There was no percentage. So uh, we don't really have a sustainable source of funding right now as well. So just kind of wanted to go through that uh, really quickly. This is talking about um, a lot of money produced 3.784 billion in new fee revenues to be produced uh, in that in the 10 to 11 year time frame, the next 10 to 11 years. 
And then $1.4 billion, 1.5 almost, in general funds and stimulus dollars that would go into the plan. So the new plan would have that $5.268 billion uh, as part of it. Just to give you a sense, um, these go into different funding sources. We currently have this Highway Users Trust Fund, which is the way that they allocate dollars to the state government, to the county governments, to the local governments. So we would get a share of that. And I just wanted to kind of go over some of those more, uh, some of those dollars in, in uh, greater detail as they apply to Longmont. I'll kind of skip over this, but I did want to kind of talk about those, uh, um, well, I don't even want to talk about this slide as much either because it's a lot of detail that's probably too much at this point, but there is some, um, there's some in information that talks about the different kinds of fees. And if you've had a chance to go over the, the different uh, summaries that we sent out, I hope you were able to see that there's some different fees that are gonna be charged. And kind of on the far right is what the new draft bill language is gonna show us. So they've changed some of this in this uh, original proposal column, which is much easier to read, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but they've changed it into this lighter column, which is much more difficult to read, but this is the new proposal. And it talks about increasing the, the, the fees a little bit um, at, a, at a slower level, but just as much uh, to get to that eight cents overall for a road route usage fee, uh, two cents uh, to start for uh, for every gallon of gas up to eight cents uh, in the next 10 years. So um, the clean truck fee, this is really more about diesel and uh, and taking some money from the diesel gas piece uh, the EV equalization fee, taking dollars, or, or actually putting a fee on top of the existing $50 electric vehicle fee, so that there's um, some form of what they're what they're feeling is like electric vehicles do not pay their share, obviously, in gas taxes because they don't pay any. So the idea is, how do you get uh, EVs to pay their share of usage on the roads without actually tracking their mileage? And so this is the best way they could do it. Uh, the TNC is really a transportation network uh, company fee. So your Uber, Lyft would pay 30 cents or um, yeah, 30 cents per ride. Delivery fees would be 25 cents per delivery. Um, and that would be for any kind of packages we had delivered to our house. So you can see that these are gonna be probably pushed on to the consumer, right? So these aren't gonna be things that Amazon pays for directly without passing that cost on to the consumer. So uh, these are part of the issues that are going forward as well. And you can see the rest of, the, rest of these as well. Um, uh, some of these, uh, the personal car share, uh, that's those different car share companies that are really doing good things by sharing, by sharing rides and cars, but they still do use the roads. So there's a way of trying to get some um, money from that. They currently have that exemption. So they'll be lifting the exemption rental, taxi, and autonomous vehicles that we talked about earlier. So um, just to give you an idea, again, the local the local fare is this 40%. So this this new bill language would have almost nine ninety five or $950 million allocated for local governments. So I think that's been a big question of how do the locals access this money? Well, we get this, we get these automatic payments that are done uh, through this formula funding, this Highway Users Trust Fund. And so um, those kind of things happen as well. And then the Front Range Rail that we talked about earlier, uh, 2.5 million in the first year to study alternative routes. So to really figure out which route um, environmentally gets chosen from that Front Range Rail. We'll kind of skip over this. I know it's really going on a little bit longer than we had hoped, but this kind of gives you a breakdown of where all those different allocations of dollars go from those different fees and how they fall into like this gas fee would go to the highway users trust fund. So the state and the local. So those would be direct payments to state roads and, uh, and local street and local roads as well and go right to the city of Longmont. Not that six, not that full amount. Obviously we get a portion of it. There's a, there's a formula that, determines what each locality gets, and we get a, part, a portion of that. So um, there's been a lot of talk about making sure this is a transparent piece of legislation. 
and there's some very good um, information that's going into that. And uh, you know, I think what I'll try to do is just uh, see what kind of questions you have at this point, or what kind of comments you might have, and it might help for Councilmember Peck as she's going into the discussions tomorrow of you know what's going on with these different um, with this legislation and, and other legislation, but with this one, just to maybe hear some thoughts on what the Transportation Advisory Board feels about this legislation. Sounds good. Thank you, Phil. Excellent uh, presentation. A lot of information in there. Um, let me just kick it off with one question that was top of mind uh, and see what other questions we have out there. Uh, I want to make sure I heard correctly there. So for the two cents um, uh, fee that was associated with uh, uh, the road usage fee, is that being collected? Uh, is, is your understanding that the intent would be to collect that at the pump um, per gallon basis there? And similarly for the um, uh, yeah, EV equalization fee, uh, is, is your understanding, what's your understanding of where that would be collected? Is that, is that done through our, primarily our, our investor-owned utilities there, Excel and Black Hills Energy, or is that being collected through some other mechanism? So to answer your second question first, the EV fee would be through the registration is my understanding. So as you, every year as you get your new sticker, your new tag for your car, your EV would be charged with that new rate as part of that registration. I believe that the road usage fee is collected at the pump, correct? So it would be that two cents of every gallon uh, initially would go toward that, uh, toward that fee. Thank you. Yes, Jacques. Yeah, so much information in those slides. I think my head started spinning there, <laughs> but it's good. Um, let's see, a couple questions. Once you mentioned the legislative, it, has the bill been introduced or is this something in future years? So that's one question. Okay. And well, it has been, the, sorry, it has been introduced. I was going to say not in future years. It's 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 been introduced. It's Senate Bill 21-260. So okay. look for 260 or, or Google that on, on online and you'll find a lot more probably details than you ever want on that, but uh, maybe some good summaries too. Yeah, it hasn't crossed my desk yet, but um, that that doesn't mean somebody doesn't know about it. <laughs> um, second question on the delivery fees and like the Ubers, I found it interesting that it was a fee without any sort of an exemption for EVs for electric vehicles. So they started thinking a little bit about this going, well, if we want to promote EVs, Maybe there's some way we, you know, if we're going to get more and more delivery vehicles and shared Ubers in the community, maybe that's something we want to promote. So that was the one thought that came to my mind is that would be a good way to try to address maybe some of the emissions um, that, that come out of our delivery vehicles. That has been one of the questions that's come up is what happens when somebody is doing an Uber um deliver taking somebody in an uber across town and so they're in an electric vehicle so they have to pay twice and what if they're like uber eats so they're delivering something to you do they have to pay three times you know do they pay the delivery fee the tnc fee and the electric vehicle fee so those questions are out there so it's a it's a it's a good in indication that uh people are talking about that good good but I, I think it's a great proposal coming from previous states that fig figured out how to fund their transportation needs. I, I think the way Colorado is growing, it's something that we need. So good work. Thanks. Not that I've done anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> you summarized it well, though. Yes, David. Uh, and this is this is not directly related to the bill, but I think when I was looking at the notes that the plan is to present this to the board or to the council, just to kind of get their, you know, to, to, to have them state a position or is that, is that the, ultimately the goal? Well, um, we were wondering, well, like I said, we've never really done these le legislative items to TAB before. So um, I may get uh, pushed back quite a bit on this for doing this 
but uh, from you, from you, the board, as well as from uh, staff and and others. But um, just the idea that uh, we were just wanting to get this information to you, so we didn't make it an action item. And there's already something in the council packet for tomorrow showing staff support for this with conditions. One of the conditions is, and I didn't talk about it at all, is that there's uh, the idea of a regional tra or a regional transit authority or transportation authority that is that authority is given to like Dr. Cog or the North Front Range so that they can ta be taxing entities. And we we really came out against that quite strongly last year when it came out, the council did. So we're our recommendation as staff is to kind of pull that piece out. It's a whole section. It's called Section 34. And our recommendation is to support with that removed. And obviously there's some other questions that we have too about like like we just talked about. So those different things will be considered by city council tomorrow night as they discuss it. But we we realized we didn't have time to get a formal recommendation to council from this group. But again, we did want to take this as being a pretty major transportation item to the transportation advisory board. So you at least knew what was going on and um, you know, could ask some questions if you if you have if you cared about how this kind of moved forward. But um, you know, I don't again, I don't know if it's the board's purview wh whether they want to take this on or not, or if you want to make a recommendation to council, you could certainly state that tonight and um, council member Peck would have that to relay to the council tomorrow if she needed to. Yeah, I, I guess I I don't know whether I well I, I like I like the at least I like what I've heard and read about the bill. Um, my my only comment, and that I mentioned this before, is that I have an electric vehicle, and that when I was looking at the bill and seeing all these fees, I was thinking, ah, oh, geez, you know, there's this is not this is not encouraging me to to buy one if I didn't have one already. But but then I got to thinking that. Considering where our country has been for so long, um, I think that the the uh, legislatures that are supporting the energy, the, the current uh, oil and gas producers, they are not going to sign up on a bill that doesn't charge fees to electric vehicles. And so I think that the fact that you are concluding that, or not you, but the fact that that's <laughs> in the bill, <laughs> I think could help its likelihood of passing. And for that very reason, I would be in favor of it. That's Sounds good. It's probably worth noting that my understanding of the transportation bill is, is aiming to address both air quality as well as traffic congestion. The EVs certainly help with the air quality. Um, uh, from a long-term perspective there, but uh, the traffic congestion is still an issue that all vehicles have to be thinking about. And there is an enterprise fund that gets created with this bill that goes into providing more electric vehicle chargers around the state, uh, you know, to incentivize that as well as um, incentivize the programs to maybe create greater rebates for electric vehicles as well. Yes, yeah, Sandy. Well, I, I just appreciate seeing this and hearing more about it because we have gone for decades without um, providing any kind of revenue sources for our our state and for our, our local governments to be able to um, have upkeep on our roads. Um, nobody wants to pay for the roads and we see the congestion, the air quality is bad, our ozone levels are bad, and we need to bite the bullet and do something about it. And so I think that this this proposal that they have out there is really uh, touching on a lot of things that affect everyone. I hope that it's gonna be equitable for those that really are on the margins when you start looking at your um, going to be feed here and there and yonder. Um, but if that's what it's gonna take, you know, I, I see uh, we're not able to pass bills to increase our gas tax, and this seems to be a way around it. So um, I'm happy to hear more about it and see that the legislature is really looking at options for Colorado to move forward and be improve the quality of life for everyone. Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Sandy. Any additional comments? This is Joe. I'm generally against fee-based revenue versus voter-approved taxation. Thanks. Any additional comments? There's a thought that, uh, you know, the fee-based piece will run into some kind of um, judicial um, review. <laughs> if, it, if it does get passed, it'll have to go through that legal review to make sure that it is legal. So great point, Joe. Great, I'll just add one additional comment, which is, um, uh, I'm not a huge fan of fee-based mechanisms there, but I'm also a huge fan of making sure we can provide the, the, the transportation, air quality and congestion funding that's necessary. And since all the other mechanisms have not been successful, uh, this is certainly uh, uh, the best solution that I've seen um, so far and for would have my full support. But uh, Phil, thank you for uh, being able to bring it to our attention and uh, keeping folks in the loop. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. And I'll probably take some more of it here with the next item. All right, back at you. Peak rail service, you're on. <laughs> okay, sorry, more slides and I apologize. It's it's probably getting a little much at this point, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. Appreciate it. I hope you can see these on your screen. Hopefully it's a little bigger than others, but uh, uh, I just wanted to give you another update. This is again, just more information to provide to you so that you have a better understanding of kind of what we're doing at the staff level and what's going on with your city council as well, uh, and, and maybe ways to get involved. Uh, also, so um, as you all know, <laughs> it, it's the broken record of Phil Greenwald. Um, Northwest Rail, 2004, we voted for fast tracks. We were supposed to get a Northwest Rail line from downtown Union Station up to Longmont through Boulder. We had a number of stations along that line. So uh, just to give you, a, you, you guys all know this, right, up and down. So nothing new. We just wanted to kind of share this with you. And then the idea is this piece can't be built by RTD at this point in time. So they don't have the funding. They're not gonna, you know, they, um, you can say whatever you will about what RT, what happened at RTD. There's a lot of things that have happened over the last uh, 20, 20 some, almost 20 years, um, well, closer to 15, I guess. But there's been a lot of things that have gone on. Um, and a lot of it has to do with that rail line is BNSFs, it belongs to them. It's their property. Um, whether you agree with that or not, how they got the property, you know, and the, uh, you know, the way the railroads were all kind of built and how they uh, found these routes or how they built these routes. Uh, and they're basically given the land to do that, but they put in all the capital investment and the labor to get it done. So um, these do belong to BNSF. So that's a piece of it. So they were going to charge a lot of money, about half a billion dollars, to uh, to use their line, and that was a big part of the 1.5 billion dollar cost that we're at not right now, for how much it costs to build this at 11 stations, four unfunded stations, frequency of rail being 15 minutes, 30 minutes off peak, uh, all the things that you see on this slide. What we since done, and, and um, Councilmember Peck was a major piece of this, quite frankly was to talk about the peak service concept and is there a way we could do it for cheaper? And is there a way we could just get rail started and just kind of get the idea and get get some feel of what rail would be like? So uh, we came up with this plan with RTD of doing three morning trips from Longmont to Denver, three evening trips from Denver to Longmont, uh, just really commuter only rail service. And I think this happens in a lot of other cities around the country and around the world. And the idea is that this would get us um, down to Denver Union Station using all the stops that we talked about previously under fast tracks, but it would be very far uh, removed from the current from the original plan of all the trains all day long. So there'd be there'd be issues with that. Uh, still running on diesel technology, so that's been an issue as well. But that's the concept. Then on April 6, 2021, was uh, a, a pretty good day for Longmont where uh, RTD board supported a level two study, which was really kind of this medium level of spending, uh, five to $8 million of spending from what's called the 
Fast Track's internal savings account, the FISA funds, uh, to uh, to start moving on this study and start getting some real costs evaluated for this study level. Um, so they they supported a level two study, which was really to do that planning and environmental linkages study, which is a is a little bit more environmental work to make sure that you are meeting all the environmental standards, uh, make sure that we knew what vehicle technology and impacts there would be. Um, a little a medium level of community engagement along the way. I think the community wants to hear about this, so that's a good thing. And the timeline from notice to proceed, the NTP would be 18 months to two years. And the funding needed again is that eight, uh, five to $8 million. So how do we get there? And this is really that talking about really just the phase one piece of this is to start developing that operating plan or working with a consultant to develop an operating plan for that service, what that preliminary design would look like. Again, back to those environmental impacts and identify those and how do you mitigate those environmental impacts. There might be some land that's also needed because you're talking about some, some places where you have to do passing track along this corridor. Um, most of it's out there, quite frankly, but I think there's some open space that might need to be purchased. And, and I think that would be a Boulder County question at that point. And so, uh, and, and then some key agreements that need to happen and then the risk, the mitigation, mitigation of the risk involved on this as well. And then we move into phase two is really kind of the next piece after we're done with this piece of the study is, uh, you know, that long-term funding for O&M, operations and maintenance of this line, actually acquiring the property, the operating rights with BNSF, and get into those key agreements. But we have to know those costs that are in this, in kind of this section, we need to know those costs as we move into phase two. And then phase three would really be that detailed design, the permitting, the construction, and starting that revenue service. So you can see there's a lot of different elements or three major elements to this that need to move forward. So right now we have begun, um, this RTD has begun the whole idea of getting this ball rolling. Uh, with the board recommendation and the board uh, approval of spending dollars. By year end of 2021, we hope to have a consultant on board and give them that notice to proceed so they can start working on it and then get that phase one completed by 2023. And I know that's way too much time to take to do this, but that's kind of the way this all has to work in order to kind of slowly roll forward here. And the last piece of this is just what I talked about kind of earlier was the idea that this is kind of on top of the whole idea of this Amtrak service that would run more of a express service through our corridor. Uh, they would stop in Longmont. Uh, it would go up to Loveland and Fort Collins and it would go down to Boulder and Denver, uh, as well as down to Castle Rock, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, those different areas as well. So that's the Amtrak service. Uh, this peak rail is really about the fast track service, but we do have all these different partners and regional collaboration. So we have all our commu communities along the corridor. BNSF is obviously a huge player in all this. And luckily they've been very key to the front range passenger rail corridor um, and, that, and that commission. So they're on that commission. So working RTDs on that commission as well. So they've all been kind of working together to talk about the bigger Amtrak piece, but then also these smaller pieces that are important to us as well. Um, and you'll see these other ones here. CDOT's obviously a big one. And then I talked about Front Range Passenger Commission and Amtrak is on that as well. So huh, wanted to get that out to you. Make sure you uh, heard about it and knew about it uh, and kind of what we're dealing with at the staff level to make sure this is moving forward. So with that, I will stop sharing and take any questions. Thank you, Phil. Any questions on uh, what you just heard there? <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate you letting me speak so much tonight. I will I will have to pay people off in our staff with donuts and probably coffee, but thank you for listening. Phil, before you jump off, um, uh, uh, one quick question for me. For the last 18 years, BNSF has been res uh, hesitant to want to commit to naming a figure on a firm figure on, on on what they would be willing to pay for the right of way or shared right of way on uh, the, the corridor that that you pointed out that that they own. Um, 
Has there been any movement there that is encouraging in terms of uh, BNSF's uh, uh, willingness to uh, kind of be more forthright with with what the right of way acquisition or 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 the sharing of the line costs uh, were be, or is it kind of like more of the same from from BNSF? And do you know of of any leverage that the community has over BNSF, or is it is it something that uh, is is really in in their hands? Yeah, I will just say that uh, BNSF is a powerful organization that has a lot of control over their land. And I think uh, I could get anybody on on this call that's grayed out right now and not showing their face to agree with me on that one. Um, and they're all probably laughing as they're on uh, not on video, but it's been a really tough time working with BNSF. But that's not to say that, you know, they're a business, right? So they they own this and they want to make sure that it operates uh for their business model which is to move freight and so amtrak has some trackage rights to be able to use those corridors based on that agreement from like 1971 and so amtrak is able to do that what we're trying to do here with this program is provide that 30 percent level of design so we can really go to bnsf with some firm operation knowledge and some operating um, details to take to BNSF and say, look, here's all our cards. Here's what we know. And then they've they've said that they're willing and, and maybe Tyler or, or, or council member Peck can chime in here as well because Tyler did go a year ago to visit with BNSF as part of a larger front range or a North, Northwest rail contingent. And they did talk about, and I think it was a very positive meeting a year ago, right before COVID. Um, and uh, they had a very positive discussion about you know, if you can provide this 30% level of design, we can give you actual costs and we can be much more upfront with you if we know what you really want. And up until now, BNSF has not had a good idea of what RTD or what this corridor wants or what they need and what exactly they're going to put on the ground. And so 30% design gets us a lot, a long way there. So Tyler, I don't know if you have some insight from your meeting you know, last February, but or February before last. Right, right, right before any travel restrictions hit. Um, so I think one of the key things with that, um, Bill mentioned the preliminary engineering agreement has been a big one for BNSF, and that was a big change that they made about a year and a half or two years ago, where prior they would review design, and more or less they would bill you back for their review time or their consultant's review time through the construction of a project. And I think they were struggling with reviewing fast, fast track plans for, for 10, 15 years and spending a lot of time and dollars to do that and not really getting anywhere. So I think that's you know, one of the big changes we saw is now they're, if you want to work with them, you have to commit to paying them to review what, the product you're putting in front of them. So I think that this is the part of the first step is that preliminary engineering agreement. We'll, uh, RTD will be working on design. BNSF will be reimbursed for their time for reviewing the plan and so I think that's ultimately probably a better way to actually get somewhere at this point and get some actual numbers. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. The life of a monopoly. Uh, life of monopoly. <laughs> it's got, they hold the cards. All right, any additional questions for Phil? Thank you. All right, thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Well done. All right, comments from board members. We'll just go in the order uh, that people just happen to be uh, uh, on my screen here. Um, uh, Joe, uh, any comments on your side? So I'm mute there, but it looks like you're saying no, so I'll... Sorry about that, no, no comment. Okay, thanks. Awesome, Sandy, uh, you're next on my screen here. Any comments on your side? Um, it was a great meeting. I appreciated all the information and the time and energy that staff put into giving us documents beforehand and presenting today. So thank you. Well said. David, you're next on my screen here. Uh, any comments on your side? I got to introduce you to my granddaughter. Um, I thought it was I was a very interesting meeting. Thank you, Phil. Um, and uh, I can't remember the fella with the beard, um, but uh, thank you, thank him. Uh, one thing I would like to say, uh, 
Um, this mama. Yeah, we've got a lot going on in this house these days, so I probably won't be applying. In fact, I know I won't be applying for the uh, to fill this role next go around. So the next meeting will probably be my last one. I, I think I'll continue to sit in periodically, but uh, I'm going to sign off the uh, the membership anyways. Thank you, David. Courtney, anything on your side? Um. I was actually wondering if there is any plan from the city of when we might start meeting in person. Great, great okay. question. I think that we're going to discuss that uh, at council as well, because once city council opens up, probably then all the boards will as well. It's probably an overreaching umbrella decision. So, okay. so stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney, and thanks, Joan. Uh, Jacques, you're next on my screen here. Thanks, Neil. Uh, just one thought that I wanted to bring up. Um, you know, we had a uh, accident up here on Highway 66 about a month ago. That was pretty tragic. A 16 year old lost his life. And it's a section that I drive at least two or three times a day from Main Street going east over, I would say County Line Road is probably the, the segment that I've been driving. And even though it's marked as 60 miles per hour, most traffic is only going 45 or 50. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I guess that accident just kind of shook me up a little bit and I would hate to see another one. And so I know it's a state highway and we don't have much um, control over it, but I just wanted to bring it to the attention that when you have a difference in speed of 15 and 20 miles per hour, that can be a dangerous environment. So I just wanted to bring it up. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Liz? A um, couple thoughts uh, to go with what Jacques said. Um, we didn't talk about it today, but the, I'm excited to hear the results of the design phase for the Highway 66 project because um, that really does need to be looked at. We haven't gotten the state funding in the past, but it has to. Somebody's got to do something to improve the safety of that road. Um, the part I drive the most is, of course, west of Maine, and it can get with people trying to do turns and merge and all that and there's nowhere for pedestrians at all and we're going to have a lot of more building on the north side of 66 so i'm very much looking forward to that and then uh the other thing was um we had that chance during the past month to look at the county multimodal plans and i noticed a spot where their plans didn't match longmont's plans i brought it to their attention but i i think we need to keep watching to make sure that we're coordinating well between what the city's planning to do and what the county's proposing to do. Thanks. And thanks to everybody who's done all this great work. Thanks, Liz. Appreciate that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, if I could hop in real quick. A couple of things on 66. Um, so, Jock, I know you'd ask for some data and we'll get that to you. Um, in terms of the speed study and how CDOT's methodologies for setting speeds. Um, to this point, they're still really heavily based on the 85th the idea of the 85th percentile speed. So we've got a couple of options we could pursue. The first one, generally, to change the speed limits on state highways, it's the municipal, the local authority makes the request. So that would be me requesting CDOT to do a speed study and post the speed limit based on the results of that. I heard you mention you think that the majority is at 45 to 50. And if that is reality, if that's what we're seeing and what we're measuring, that would be cause for adjusting the speed limit on Highway 66. The other thing we can do, absent, uh, it's it can be sort of a gamble because if they collect data and it says everyone's going 70, they may adjust the speed limit up or down. So the other thing we can do is we can work with them on a speed check and we can also collect some data on our own end to see what that looks like. And if that's a request we wanna put in and make at this point, if it does show in that 45 to 50 range, yeah, maybe it make, makes some sense to put that request in right now. 
And then Liz, to your point, and, and the 66 corridor in general, we are, that that is under design right now. And one of the assumptions we've had a lot of discussion with, with the state on is we're, we're doing a whole new design project. We're committing a lot of dollars to improving this corridor, both for uh, mobility of, of all modes. We're looking to try and improve the, there's there's not a lot of pedestrian facilities. So improving the bike facilities, improving the sidewalks. And, and with that, we're really pushing hard for a lower design speed. So we're, we're working with CDOT to, hey, we're, we're investing a lot of dollars in this corridor. We're doing a full redesign, reconstruction. Here are some of the key critical elements for us. And that's one that staff's really been pushing and working with CDOT on in terms of how can we impact speed limits on this end ahead of time rather than be reactive after the fact. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, well, I mean, additional comments on, on my side. Um, I, I know you've been having an extended detour on uh, the St. Vrain bike path uh, greenway. Um, you know, it's it's it sounds like it's going to it's already been for you know a year and a half or so, uh, give or take a little bit. It sounds like it's still looking you know several years on out before it's uh, you know complete. And if, if that's going to be the case, there I would really encourage uh, uh, our transportation staff to to look at what we can do to keep on running extra sweeps of uh, street sweeping uh, in the area. Um, um, and and just continuing to to try and, and and look at I know there are some new signs put up uh, that I haven't had a chance to uh, to see the latest configuration there so maybe the signs are super intuitive maybe they're not um, but since it's such a long detour I think anything that we can do to be able to try and make it as um, intuitive and, and and pleasant whether it's some temporary restriping or um, anything else that can be done to make it really convenient for community members there that want to address, you know, continue to ride that that path and address that that missing link. So um, no specific um, no specific question there, but but that, that's an important one there to be able to make sure that we can continue to ensure that uh, that the really positive experience that people have in, in riding the rest of the St. Brian bikeway. Greenway. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Peck. Any comments on your side? No, I really don't. This was a, a really good presentation. A lot of information. Indeed, indeed. All right, well, it looks like we have our upcoming meeting in 10 days on uh, the 9th Avenue, Hopper Street to uh, Kaufman Open House that was mentioned earlier. And um, uh, looks like at the next meeting, we'll be talking about the neighbor traffic mitigation um uh, program so tyler thanks for being able to and the rest of the team thanks for being able to keep that top of mind and uh, looking forward to uh to hearing the latest and greatest uh, is there anything else pressing before we wrap up all right well done to our staff uh thank you for the heavy lift today uh your presentation was excellent so presentations uh, were excellent so thank you very much with that we'll consider the meeting closed and uh, we'll reconvene uh, next month in june thanks everybody have a great night